come on to glory in your presence. I take authority in the spirit right now. In the name of Jesus, any agenda of darkness standing against the ministry of your word, I reject it. I declare that the blood of Jesus is against you right now. Thank you, Father, for your power. Thank you for your divine anointing in this place. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for neutralizing any ideologies that we have been holding that are not biblical. In the name of Jesus. Lord, you are here. 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 You are here in Jesus' name. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your awesomeness. Thank you for your beauty. Oh, God, you are glorious. You are glorious. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give God a hand of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Father. Ha. Thank you, Jesus. God is in this place. Thank you, Jesus. I greet you all in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Special greetings to our visitors and those who are watching us virtually. Welcome to Higher Dimension Ministries. This is a church where everybody is somebody. This is a Davidic church. Hallelujah. Also greetings to all our pastors, all our elders, and all our leaders in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to extend my special greetings and acknowledgement to our spiritual parents as well. Bishop David Msiza and Pastor Prudence Msiza. Uh, let's just give them a, a, a clap of hands. Thank you, a clap offering. Just to appreciate them. Once again, I'm privileged uh, that the man of God has entrusted this platform uh, to minister the word. This morning, I just want to acknowledge and appreciate him, our father, Bishop David Msiza. We are, or I'm very blessed myself um, to be allowed to be ministering the word with you, church, this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just appreciate the man of God for entrusting me with this pulpit. Hallelujah. Last week we prayed um, over a few things, but I, I just want to pay my attention slightly on. There are few people who raise their hands for healing. Are they here, those people who raised their hands last week? Because I want to know, is there anyone here who says, I received my healing last week? Of those who, who raised their hands. If you are here, raise your hand if you received your healing. Hallelujah. Is there anyone at all? There we go. There we go. Let's give God a clap offering. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We appreciate what God has done. It's very important to acknowledge when God has done something because he is able to do miracles. He's able to do anything that is desired by us according to his will. He is powerful and he's still powerful and he hasn't changed and he has returned in all his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go straight to the word. This morning, um, I'm doing part number two of spiritual detox. That's the theme that we are talking about. We, I'm doing part number two. Um, hopefully, I'll do briefly. I just want to allow God to do some things. See? Um, so I'll just give you highlights on this sermon in particular. Um, hallelujah. Spiritual detox. We spoke last week that there are certain things that we can believe and we end up doing that are not helpful and even harmful to us. 
So there are certain things that we can end up believing in our faith that are not necessarily helpful. And they can end up being harmful to us. So that's why we need to detox some of those things. And the reason why it is important is because some of those things, they are hindering us from seeing God's power in our generation. The Lord Jesus said you will do greater things than this. And he was not talking about just talking. He was also talking about the demonstration of God's power. The Bible says the, 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 Holy, the Lord Jesus Christ had the Holy Spirit upon him and power. And he went about doing all good because God was with him. So Christianity is a, is a faith that is results-based. It is result-based, fruit-based. It is not theories. It is not explanations. It is power-packed. It is a power-packed faith. Hallelujah. So we realized, well, I was ministering last week, just to give a few highlights of last week. Based on Mark chapter 9, verse 14 to 29, when Jesus said this type, this type. So he was giving an explanation after the disciples asked the question, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? So he, he helped them understand that there is this type. But he didn't say all types. So that, that is why I said, one of the things we need to detox from is how we converted Jesus' way of explaining at this type. Now we are thinking it is meaning all types. What is that meaning? It means we have now, because Jesus gave an explanation on one instance, most of us have turned to a doctrine of explanations on every occasion where we don't get a breakthrough. That's why we need to detox because he said this type. Not all types. So there are many of us who have formulated reasons and explanations why we don't have breakthroughs. Why we don't have fruits, why we don't have miracles, why there is no progress, why there is no victory, why there are no healings and no recovery of all. Many reasons exist. So there are people who work on explaining situations. The moment is difficult, they will give a reason or an explanation. And most of these man-made reasons, man-made reasons, they are not helping us because what they end up doing, they build a wall in our hearts. So if something you were trusting, you were rightfully trusting God for, end up not happening, and someone gives you an explanation, that thing is, you're going to shelf it. That's what's going to happen. But you're not going to get a healing or your progress. You will still be thinking about, but that never happened. So Jesus did not say every type will be complicated, nor need to be explained. He didn't say that. So that's why he said this type. He didn't say every now and then you will get to a problem of not getting breakthroughs or miracles. He didn't say that. And mind you, he healed, he solved the matter first before he can offer an explanation. Why? Because the explanation was meant to help these disciples. And what happened? The disciples, after he left, they are the ones who did miracles. They never struggled with a distype anymore. Never. You can read the book of Acts. They never struggled with a distype. They did power-packed miracles. So Christian faith is a result-based faith. It is dangerous. That's one of the things I mentioned last week. It is dangerous to limit your faith because someone you trust as a superhero has, has failed to get a breakthrough. 
Don't limit your faith because someone that you, you perceive as a superpower of faith didn't get a breakthrough on that thing that maybe you asked them to help you on. Now you end up, because if you do that thing, you will cripple your own faith. Because you don't know what caused them not to get a breakthrough. So if you have a right, you know this is what God said about this matter. It is his will that I have this. Then you, you have every reason to push. No matter the explanations you get, you still have to push. Don't limit your faith. So that's why it is important. The question of the disciples is, why couldn't we? Why couldn't we solve the matter? They didn't blame the boy who was having a demonic spirit. Like most of us would do after we didn't get a breakthrough on something. They didn't blame the situation. They said, since Jesus solved it, then it means there's something that we, maybe we didn't do right. Or there's something that was not okay. So most of us, we, we, we don't want to ask this question before God. God, why didn't I get the breakthrough? We don't want to. We avoid it. We become comfortable with the explanation and we move on. We don't want to inquire from God, why didn't I? What happened? Another thing that is important is we need to learn to protect our faith. Why? Because faith operates in environments, different environments, including our own hearts, including your own heart. Your own heart is an environment. So if it is filled with explanations that are not biblical on a matter that you have been trusting God for, those, they are creating an environment that is hostile for your faith to again trust God for something. That's why you need to detox those things. It creates a hostile environment. So our faith needs to be protected from any hostile environment. Faith has its own dynamics. It operates but with dynamics in place. So you need to keep them in check. What is the environment? Because you won't know at what time did it drop. One moment you were in faith, the other moment maybe it, it drops. Hence you need to detox from all things you thought made sense, but they never solved your problem. There are things that I mentioned last week that they would make sense when they explain to you but they don't necessarily solve the problem. They can diagnose your problem, but they don't give a solution. So you need to detox from all those reasons because they limit your faith. God is still able, he is willing, and he is ready to manifest his power. I want to be reluctant. There is no way where God is reluctant to manifest his power. Let me show you an example. First John chapter 5 verse, uh, verse 14 to 15. The Bible says this is the confidence we have when we approach God, when we ask. That whatever we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we can be assured that we have that which we are asking for. So if you got it right in principle, meaning you know this is God's will, then you have every reason to push. You need to be able to avoid the copy and paste approach when it comes to faith matters. Don't copy someone at the next door. And the situation is one how. And you don't know what got them to where they got. And now if they give you an explanation, that's what we do in life. Their own solution or their own method. Don't transfer that approach that we use in our day-to-day -day living as if it works in the spiritual. In the spiritual, matters are treated on their merits. Case by case. It's a case by case situation. So don't just copy and paste it didn't work, it's one Leona, therefore mine won't work. Don't go that approach. It doesn't work like that in the spiritual. So a copy and paste approach doesn't work. You have to inquire from God. God, I know in principle I am correct. 
I'm asking you and I'm in, in your way. Why didn't I get it? Remember, God is alive. He can speak for himself. He can speak for himself. That's why we are in a relationship with him. This faith is alive. So today, briefly I want to go in a next problem or situation that I want to explain regarding spiritual detox. The title of my sermon, Narrow the Gap on Things Hoped For. Narrow the gap on things hoped for. As you can see in that slide, that picture, when this gap is too wide, there is a problem in the receiving. When the gap is too wide, you won't be able to receive that which you are asking for. So you need to narrow the gap. The gap must be narrowed for you to see miracles, for you to see God's power. You must narrow the gap on the things that you hope for God to do. Don't allow the gap to be wide. It must be narrowed so that you are in a position to receive. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says verse number 3. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse number five, part B. And there was evening, and there was morning, first day. Hebrews 11, verse number one. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I liked what the bishop said a few weeks ago when he was teaching on the subject of faith. The bishop said, Faith is a substance. It is a raw material. So you have that which produces. Hallelujah. So that's how the bishop helped us. Today my focus is on this way, or this phrase, things hoped for. Things hoped for. So we need to note this, which summarizes my sermon. I'm giving you a summary right now. God gets what he wants within the time frame of his command. God gets what he wants within the time frame of his command. So when he speaks, you hear the Bible says, God says, let there be light. And there was light. And it was within a day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when you go through that step of creation, by the way, it was done miraculously. When God created, he was doing this miraculously. How when I saw the hammer, and a cocotta, build it, and no. So this faith that we are in, that we are believing, it is based in the power of God. Literally. You talk about the resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ resurrected through the power of the Holy Spirit. So there was a power of God at play. This faith that we are embracing, it's power-packed and power-based. So that's why we need the power to always manifest. So God gets what he wants within the time frame. Time frame means a set period of his command. So our gap, the reason why we don't see miracles, our gap is too big. And it's too wide. Meaning from initiation to manifestation, our gap is too big. When we initiate that God, this is the situation, this is what I'm trusting you for. To get to see it, our gap is too wide. And there was a problem that caused that gap to be there. And I'm going to explain what are those problems. Our mistake as, a, as, as Christian community, as Christian people, we futurize every matter we pray for. Every single matter we pray for. I don't know if it's because we close our eyes. So when you close your eyes, most of the time you see darkness. So it's easy to think that something is going to be done, it's going to happen hey, in a distant future. We futurize every prayer that we make. 
That is one of our biggest mistakes. This phrase, hoped for, we, 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 we took it to mean distant or far. When the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, our inclination, we are thinking those things we are hoping for, they are somewhere there. They are somewhere there. We think like that. We think like, and when we pray, we assume they are like that. And the moment you assume that, the gap grows bigger. The gap grows bigger. So, the word hoped for comes from the Greek word elpizo, and it simply means to expect. It didn't say anything about the time frame. It didn't give you any highlight about the time. It just says to expect. To expect. So that means, that means you can pray for something and expect it. It simply says to expect. It didn't give us any highlight on the time frame. It simply says to expect. So if you pray, you are within your right to expect it. Very important. So there are certain things that are to blame for widening the gap in our faith. Number one, our emotional disposition. Our emotional disposition. How you feel can impact how you handle matters. How you feel about something can impact how you handle that matter. For an example, Prophet Jonah, he was tasked by God to go to Nineveh to preach there, to send the warning of God against that nation that judgment is due if they don't repent. Prophet Jonah in his own emotional disposition avoided the matter. He was avoidant. Why was he avoidant? Jonah had, had a foregone conclusion on Nineveh. Meaning in his own disposition, already it was as good as done. These ones are going to be judged. I'm wasting my time going there. That was his own disposition. Emotionally, he was reluctant. That's why he tried to go to Tashish. He was reluctant to do it because he already thought it is as good as done. So his emotional disposition didn't see any point in going there. It's a waste of time. I don't see them repenting. He was set. I don't see these people repenting. And the agenda of God was simple. Go there and proclaim that should they not repent. But God, the way he put it, he says, uh, in 40 days time, Nineveh will be destroyed. It was not a very deep sermon. That was his one sentence, sermon. And he was given that message by God. But something happened. The people repented. So they believed his word. He himself didn't believe that this word is going to do anything. I'm just going there to make an announcement. And then I come back and watch what's going to happen to Nineveh. And amazingly, just that one sentence, nothing unassisted by his, his charisma, no, no impact. He didn't try to put any spices. That one sentence, the people repented from the king all the way down. Already he was on this side, not believing anything can happen out of this visit. God had another agenda. Hallelujah. So Jonah was making an announcement, not expecting any change. I'm just going to go tell them. Just be aware, because God is forcing me to go and do it. So what, I just have to do it anyway. That was his position, his emotional disposition on these people of, of, of Nineveh. So Brother Jonah preached something that he didn't believe himself. So he said, 
in this sermon that I'm preaching, I don't expect God to do anything. His emotional disposition was like that, that I'm just preaching to make it pass. That was his emotional disposition. Why? Because he had prejudged. He had prejudged and foreconcluded that matter. In his mind, it was as good as done. And God says, go give them this warning. He didn't say this is what's going to happen. He didn't say, I conclude that I'm going to do it. He just said, just alert them that 40 days, something will happen. So they decided to yield and respond to that word and changed. So Jonah's, uh, Jonah was said on his emotional disposition towards Nineveh. So wrong disposition widens the gap. That gap can grow bigger if you have wrong disposition emotionally. If you have wrong disposition, if you have an experience that makes you not to trust God, it can widen that gap. Because every time, it will pop up. So if you have any unresolved matter, before you trust God for the next thing, your emotional disposition will bring that matter. What is it doing? It is retrialing your faith. You thought you are done with it, but not exactly. So you, your faith is constantly being kept on a retrial. You thought you are done, therefore you have moved on. No. Because every time you trust God for the next thing, that one pops in. Emotionally, you are refilling certain things. Well, last time when I trusted, you, you, that's because of that matter. So it is widening that gap. And when it gets bigger and bigger, it becomes difficult to see anything happening. Another thing that we do often We, we hurt ourselves in many things because we don't want to be wrong. And I'll make an example. We don't want to be wrong on certain proclamations we made. And therefore, we hurt our face. We widen that gap. How so? Some of the people, hopefully they are not here, but there are some people in this life, Otola, Maybe every now and then God uses them in dreams. They dream, they see things in their dreams. And from time to time they see their dreams manifesting. Now they end up, every dream they have, they set it as fixed. So one moment they dream and God shows them maybe someone dying. Instead of them praying and reversing, they are preparing for the funeral. Because they say, Nahangakalora. If I have a dream, I know. So if they narrate it to you, they are already crying. Because they dreamt someone in the family dead. Already they are preparing a funeral. What is that? They don't want to be wrong on what they have proclaimed. So their disposition is so fixed on certain things that they don't realize that I am hating, I'm hate, I am hating my faith. I am widening that gap. Because they don't want to be wrong. I know it. So we need to check that. Because remember, it is going to be difficult to trust God on something that you were already fixed on its outcome. It's different. When you already took it as it is and you say, that's it. So how are you going to say, God, I'm trusting you to overturn it? 
Because you are also trying to fight your way of being right. You want to be right and say, remember that dream I dreamed? And it was not meant to get a hal. It was meant for you to be aware so that you pray against it. It becomes a challenge when you are fixed on something to trust God to, to reverse it. So you end up being a victim of your own dreams, of your own prophecies, of your own beliefs, and of your own faith or lack thereof. That gap widens if you are in that situation. So this is an important key. You should never file conclusively without God's verdict on a matter. You should never put a matter as said and done and concluded if God hasn't pronounced on it. Because the moment that you file it conclusively as a deal that is concluded as a done deal, then the problem will be you won't be able to be confident to bring it before God. Because you are scared to be wrong. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 10, there's a story there of a rich young ruler where Jesus taught a very profound truth in a very simple way. After this rich young ruler, you know the story. I'm not going to even narrate it because time is not on my side. That's why Jesus was saying, he came to the disciples and say, gentlemen, as you see that guy living, you saw the situation, you were witnesses to it. It is going to be difficult for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. Now he's helping the disciples. Remember, he called them to be fishers of men. He's helping them to detox something. Hallelujah. Let me show you how he's helping them. He says to them, gentlemen, it is easier for a camel, as big as it is, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they are all with big eyes looking at him and say, then you called us to be fishers of men? And you are telling us this is going to be impossible. What, are, what kind of results are we going to get out of this? I'm helping you paraphrasing what they were saying. What kind of results? We are used to getting some returns. We know we are skilled in matters. We are fishers. We, we have been fishermen all our lives. So you are telling us, you've just called us to be fishers of men. That's how you introduce yourself. And now you are telling us that it's going to be impossible to get the results. And uh, he said, yes. If it is in your power, it is going to be impossible. But not with God. For with God, all things are possible. So Jesus was basically saying, salvation of people is a miracle. It is not dependent on your charisma. It is not dependent on your ability. It is the grace of God at work. That's a miracle when a person gets saved. So he said, let me quickly help you because before you get frustrated. This is not going to be on your account and on your efforts. You need to know that you need to allow God with his power to see you to the results. And they took it. They knew that it is not possible to do what we are called to do without God being in the equation. So Jesus says, I'm shutting that door, making you aware that it is not your power and your abilities. Let me quickly help you before you could even start. He canceled it and he said, you have to rely on God's power. And they did. And it's the same with you and I. There are things that are humanly impossible that we will meet from time to time. But with God, all things are possible. This is how Apostle Paul understood that statement. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 4. He said, and my, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? That your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. So he went to Corinth to, to, Corinth to preach, and he said, I came here as someone who doesn't have to convince you in anything by my own abilities. I allowed God to do what he wants to do. Meaning, I wa he was almost like in the same situation as Prophet Jonah, that I was almost in convincing in the way I was preaching this gospel. I just allowed the power to flow. So that you don't rely on Paul. You rely on God. Hallelujah. Narrow the gap. Now, question would be, how do I narrow the gap? How do I narrow this gap, shorten it, make it smaller and smaller so that I see the results? This is an important part. Synchronize your faith to the time frame of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has a certain time frames on things, including on things that you expect and hope for from God. You need to synchronize. We you say it's a mile and it must be in sync with God's time frame, whatever you are trusting him for. So that means you won't see many miracles if your faith is set on eventuality or ordinary. It will happen anyway. If your faith is set on eventualities, then you are in ordinary mode. It will eventually happen one day. If you are in that mode, then you will hardly see miracles in your life. You are out of sync. You are out of sync. Let's check. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 7. Let's see the time frame of the kingdom of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 7 in the New International Version. God, again, is speaking about one promise of rest. But this is how God said it, and it's very important. God again set a certain day, calling it today. God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The time frame of the kingdom of God is on today, permanently. It is set on today permanently. Don't assume tomorrow, don't assume in the next few months, don't assume any of that. The time frame of the kingdom of God, as far as faith matters are concerned, it is set on today. Hallelujah. And I'm not talking about the 27th of March. Faith, faith, must, faith must and should always be in today's time frame. Today speaks of the present. The now. The now. So that means faith you conceive now. Carry now. And give birth now. You conceive today, you carry today, and you give birth today. In the language of faith, you must synchronize it there. You synchronize it in that way permanently. It is expected that way. This is how the, the Lord te uh, taught the Israelites. In Numbers chapter 9, Verse, from verse 17, I'll just summarize it because time is not on my side. The Bible says God was leading them through the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. The Bible says whenever the cloud moved, they would move. 
If it stops, they would stop. Now, the Bible takes this into a greater detail. It says sometimes it would be there overnight. It would remain standing overnight. And the Israelites will check. The moment it moves, the next day, they would move. The Bible says whether by day or by night. Listen to that. Either by day or by night. The moment it moves, they would move. It doesn't matter whether it's at night or it's during the day. As long as the day today has manifested, they would move. They would move. The Bible says sometimes it would be there for three months. Sometimes for a year. But there was still whenever it moves. So tell me, if a person is in a whenever it moves, at which time frame are they in? Today and the here and now. Because it didn't matter. It doesn't matter if something happens tomorrow. That tomorrow when you see happening, what will it be called? Exactly. So that's why God says don't move when you conceive it. Don't move when you carry it. Don't move when you birth it. Set them in the same timeline today. You initiate it and you receive it today. What if it doesn't happen today? It means you carry it today and the next day, today, in the same faith of when you conceived it. Because it was conceived then. And it has to manifest today. You consistently maintain your faith. Are we adjusting? Are we adjusting in the times? Because the moment you say tomorrow, you have changed it. The moment you say next month, I'm trusting on next month is going to happen. And I'm not saying that there's something wrong in putting a time and so forth. What I'm saying is the moment you are conceiving or trusting God for, that time for its manifestation must always be set to today. Permanently. That's where they were, the Israelites. The Bible says sometimes the clouds stayed only overnight and lifted the next morning. Then they would go. They were in a today mode. They were taught to synchronize to the move of God. That's where we, we are out of sync. We are out of sync because we have picked different times. If we ha it happens, for most of us, we don't even do that. We don't even put a time when we pray. We just say, Father, I trust you in the name of Jesus. We eat. And then our disposition, it shows, okay, we don't expect it in a certain time. So we just want, one day, if I just wake up one day, but you are scared yourself to learn to set to today time frame of the kingdom. Because somehow you are scared to be disappointed. You are afraid of that and so forth and so forth. Now you don't want to put a, a, a time. But if you don't put a time, you won't see it. You are widening the gap. You are widening that gap. So that's how they were seeing it, the Israelites. They would say, it could be today. And they were permanently set on that, their anticipation. They were always active and ready, showing its people. These are the people who say, this is, we are on the move. They were constantly active in that way. So you wake up in the morning, the first thing you check is the cloud. That's not how they were dealing with the matters. The moment they opened their eyes, if there was no announcement at night, 
The moment they open their eyes, the clouds. Hallelujah. Because their time frame is on today. The moment they are today dawns, they look at the cloud. It has to be happening today. They keep on checking. Because their expectation is in the today mode. That's how you and I, we should be doing it if we were to see miracles. Our expectation must be on the today mode permanently. Permanently set on the today. That's why even the salvation and his rest, God said, I am setting a time. What is the time? What is the date? I am setting it on today. And that's how God set it. So if you don't pay attention to today, you would be out of sync in faith matters. If you don't pay attention, this is how the Lord Jesus said it in Matthew 6, 30, 34. I don't give, this is how it says it in, in the message Bible. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what or may not happen tomorrow. The moment you are worked up, and I'm not saying you should not plan. Planning you do plan. But I'm saying, in terms of faith matters, the Lord Jesus also explained the same matter that don't worry about the situations of tomorrow or so stress are now. You are in today, work with today, see what God is doing right now. Permanently said on today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to just do a quick prayers. Just allow the Holy, Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. I will leave the sermon right there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We need to narrow the gap. There are people that the Holy, Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, would like to touch uniquely this morning. God is here with his power. Thank you. Before, before I pray in this category, with our eyes closed, let's just close our eyes for a moment. If you are in this place, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are not born again. I just want to give you the opportunity to be born again, to receive the Lord in your own life, for him to give you a new life, as you don't need a detox in your state, but you need a completely brand new life. Is there anyone here who is not born again and who wants to come to the Lord? You will just show me by raising your hand. Is there anyone at all who would like to be born again? All right, we are all born again, I take it. Uh, let's clap hands for the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now that you are born again, now that you are born again, the Lord Jesus would like to baptize few people here in the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit to activate you in your God-given gifts to empower you for the works of ministry. You are here, you are born again, you love the Lord, maybe it's been a while. But you say, man of God, I've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you are here, you are in that category, you have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, raise your hand. The Lord would like to help you. Is there anyone here who says, I've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Some of you with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I see a hand there. Anyone else? I see. Please come forward. Let's just stand here. I'll need our pastors to also join me in this prayer. Anyone who would like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Maybe some of you are not yet released in speaking in the prayer language of the kingdom. You are not empowered in that way. 
the Lord is here with his power. He is returning and he returns with his power. So he's in this place. I don't care what the enemy has said to you before. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a real deal and you can receive it right now. Right in this place. You can just line up here. The Holy God is in this place. I would like our pastors to just encycle you to walk around and then pray as well as I also will be praying. The Bible says in Luke chapter 11. The Bible speaks that if we ask God the Father, the Holy Spirit, He is always willing. He is always willing to give us the Holy Spirit. God is not resistant. God is not reluctant. God is willing to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You just have to ask. And as you are responding, you are showing me that you want God to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. I would like our pastors to just pray around you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And the Father, you said in your word, if we ask the Holy Spirit, when only Mutimu, you won't give us anything different. Lord, I pray, Father, for these people.